Good morning. morning. All right. That's better. We had a a terrific time yesterday uh, in Rogers, Arkansas with our young people at LTC. We had about 15, I believe, of our young people that win and over 30 uh, total. And uh, our, our kids did... Uh, extremely well and it's uh, you need to know that we have a great group of young people here and it's exciting what God's doing in their lives and every one of you in a different way um, you know help contribute to forming these young minds in Christ and so uh, if you've taught in class or or you know helped um, just contributing all these things come together to help with what we're doing here with our young people and it's exciting so thank you for that um Today's lesson, we're going to start in Luke chapter 22. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 22. I want to ask why you believe that Jesus died and rose again. Why do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? A skeptic might ask you, and you might say, well, I mean, I I believe because the Bible says he did. And a skeptic would say, why do you believe the Bible? I mean, who wrote the Bible? Well, well, men did, inspired by God, but how do you know they were inspired by God? I mean, lots of religions have ancient documents and ancient writings that someone wrote just like the Bible. So, well, I, I, I just do. I believe in Jesus. I guess it's my faith. Okay, but what are you basing that on? And a skeptic, if you're not careful, could poke holes in your faith to the point that you actually realize, well, I guess, it, I, guess I was just taught this way. And I hope by the end of this lesson this morning, you will have a much stronger reason for your faith. Because the fact is, our faith tells us, the Bible tells us, we, when, when you go with God, when you join with God, and this happens in, in, you know, specifically in baptism, but when you commit your life to Christ, it's for life no matter what. Are you willing to die for this faith? Amen. Are you willing to die that this book is right? And actually inspired by Almighty God. So by the end of this lesson today, I hope to give you even uh, greater reason for that. But in Luke 22, we'll start with our uh, story this morning of of what this amazing event that happened 2,000 years ago, roughly. And so it starts in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, Jesus is there with his apostles. He's, uh, He's in great distress because he knows what's coming, but his apostles don't know. Next thing you know... A crowd comes. It's dark. So they're coming looking for Jesus. Judas is leading them. This is where Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. They take Jesus. They, they capture him, lead him away. His apostles scatter because they don't understand this. This, this is not how they had it planned. But Jesus is uh, captured, so to speak, taken away. He is, he is taken to the high priest's house. And I want you to make a mental note of that. The high priest's house. We'll come back to that. That will be important later. Peter follows at a distance. Remember, Peter, he's watching. You know, he's frightened, but he's watching. He doesn't understand. He'll deny Jesus one time. He denies Jesus two times. And in verse 60 of Luke 22, it says, Peter, this is where he denies him the third time. Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And... The Lord turned and looked at Peter. This is quite a distance because remember, Peter's not, he doesn't want to get caught up in this. I mean, this is not going down good. This is not going down well. Um, bad things are happening here, but, but Peter can't just completely walk away. And so he's watching from a distance, but they're close enough where they can make eye contact. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Peter goes out, he mourns. Um, he weeps bitterly. And then they start, the, the, the Jews that had captured Jesus, they start mocking him and beating him. They blindfolded him. They said, prophesy to us. If you're the Christ, tell us who hit you. And they abuse him, and they, and they do it in a, in a very taunting way. Then they take him to the Jewish council. They get the council together. They take Jesus before them. They interrogate him. They find him guilty. Then they take him to Pilate because the Jews couldn't crucify someone. They were under Roman occupation. They take him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate interrogates Jesus. He does not find him guilty. 
In fact, then Pilate finds out he's actually under Herod's jurisdiction. He could get Herod involved. He does. Herod kind of interrogates him. He finds him innocent as well. All the while, they'll, every, you know, periodically they'll just beat him, beat Jesus. They'll uh, taunt him. Finally, Pilate tells the crowd, uh, these Jewish leaders, he's sitting out, you know, a crowd is gathering, but he tells them, I, I, Jesus, I need to release Jesus. He's not guilty. The crowd still, they, they want him crucified. So Pilate goes to plan B. Well, once a year, tradition, Pilate would release a prisoner as a gesture of goodwill to the people. He would release a prisoner. A, a prisoner. He was going to release Barabbas, who was a murderer, but he probably would have been favored by the people because Barabbas murdered in an insurrection. So the Jews might have found, you know, they might have wanted Barabbas. And Pilate says, I, I, I was... I was going to release Barabbas, but I, could, I can release Jesus. He's, he's innocent. I don't find him guilty. I can release him. No, they want Jesus crucified. In verse 20, Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate goes a third time and asks them and tries to release Jesus, and they just shout all the more loudly, and finally, Pilate gives in. So he hands Jesus over to be crucified. Um, those events kind of proceed. He, he, he is led to the place where the crucifixion will take place. Uh, Simon of Serene is, is commandeered to carry his cross behind him. And verse 27 says, There followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. His apostles are, we're not really sure. You know, Peter, Peter's watching. John is there close by. But there is a multitude. There is a, there. So you have this, this group that were shouting, crucify him. But then you have these that, they were disciples of Christ. They believed he was the Messiah. And they're deeply saddened by this. And they, it wasn't just women. But they followed Jesus to the cross. And there they crucify him, and there he hangs six hours. And then finally, Jesus makes, uh, in the midst of hanging on the cross, he makes this statement, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. That's the, that's the Roman guards. And in this one verse, I think it's just amazing, this one verse, such a, such a massive, uh, profound event is taking place and God who's come in the flesh to die for the sins of mankind even has greater love for mankind much greater than you and I because Jesus would make this statement who would make this statement hanging on a cross who's innocent and say God forgive them I wouldn't make that statement I wouldn't my flesh wouldn't want to I'd like to I would like to hope I could be spiritual enough but Jesus makes this statement this this just Greatest event in human history is taking place. And what are the guards doing? They're oblivious to it. They're oblivious. They're dividing up his garments like any old crucifixion. Then Jesus dies, and before he dies, he makes that statement, I commit my spirit into God. Into, he, says to the, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he dies. And he dies for the sins of mankind. I appreciate how Richard uh, brought that out, talking in, about communion, that, um, you know, Jesus had the, the weight of sin on him, and that had never happened, and he and the Father had never been separated. But this moment, Jesus has to take on the sins of all, and he died for all sins. He died for the sins of those Jewish leaders. He died for the sins of the crowd that was sympathetic to him. He died for uh, his apostles' sins. He died for the Roman sins. He died for those guards that are dividing up his clothes for their sins. He, divide, he died for Peter's sins. He, divide, he died for Judas' betrayal for that sin. And he died for your sins. He died for my sins. We fall short every day. You have fallen short today, I'm sure, with some thought that's carnal, some thought that's not really dialed in to where God is, some uh, a bit of uh, selfishness, 
somehow Jesus died. That sin was there too. Your worst sins, you know, in our eyes we rate them. Your worst sins, your best sins, your small sins, and your largest, most embarrassing and shameful all of them. Well, verse 54, it was preparation day. And what that means is uh, as Jews observed the Sabbath the day before, which is Friday, they would prepare because they couldn't work on Saturday. And so they'd get everything prepared. And so day of preparation, the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and and how his body was laid, then they returned to prepare spices and ointments. So this is a little odd. Normally, if it wasn't for the Sabbath, they would have, um, they might have <clears throat> gone to see where, he, where his tomb was and then go, because they didn't know he was, this was all going to happen. So, but if it was in the middle of the week, then they would go get the spices, prepare them, they'd go straight back to that tomb and anoint his body. Except in this event, there's the Sabbath. So they go to the tomb first because they're going to need to know where to come and anoint his body with the spices. Then they go, prepare them, then it is Sabbath and they rest. They don't do anything. And then the next day, Luke 24, first day of the week, Sabbath is over, early dawn, they go to the tomb, they take the spices. So the reason this verse is important is some skeptics would say, you know, the empty tomb, maybe Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. Maybe the women found the wrong tomb. Ladies, you ever get lost and go, go somewhere, you know, you didn't mean to go there? Made a mistake? Women, does anyone ever, any lady ever make a mistake? That's a weird question, I know. So some would say, well, these women, they just found the wrong tomb. Notice how Scripture says they knew where Jesus was. They went there first. They watched so the first day of the week, they go and they find the tomb with a, with a stone rolled away. So the door is open, so to speak. Jesus is not there. Now his, his clothing is there. The burial clothing is there. And they see two angels and the angels say, why do you seek the living among the dead? And the angels say to these women, they say, he's not here but has risen. Remember how he told you? While he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. You ever forget things that God has said, and you hear a sermon, or you hear a class, or you read your Bible, and you remember how good God is, how faithful he is? You, you remember what we're really supposed to be doing some, some, isn't that amazing? So God's word and, and those things you knew, you heard, but then we get sidetracked and we forget and something will bring it to memory. These women, they, they say, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. He did say that. And they remembered. And this is a, what an event, what a thing to witness. These ladies are the first witnesses of the resurrection. It's another great evidence that this story is not made up because in the first century, women could not even be legal witnesses in a court of law. They did not have they were not given that status. And so this story that some say was made up no one would make up a story where the first witnesses in the first century in this event was women. They wouldn't do that. They would have the witnesses be men. But scripture records it was these women and maybe uh, and I don't think that was an accident. I think it was an honor to them. And nevertheless, they, they are the first witnesses of the resurrection. So, but they haven't seen Jesus yet. So they return back to the apostles from this empty tomb. And they go tell the apostles. And the apostles heard them. But scripture says it seemed to them like an idle tale. Sometimes men don't listen. Sometimes men don't listen. <clears throat> uh, there are times Stephanie tells me something. I say, you didn't tell me that. And she says, yes, I told you. And she'll kind of explain what she told me. I said, yeah, yeah, but I, but I wasn't listening. I wasn't listening to you then. That doesn't count. 
sometimes men don't let these apostles they heard these women yeah yeah we hear what you're saying they did not believe it but peter verse 12 says peter rose and ran he didn't believe it but he wanted to believe it and so we'll have some things happen here um, and that's really kind of an outlier, but you'll see a theme here regarding these, these Christians or disciples of Christ regarding their hope and their belief, uh, because for the most part, they are very skeptical. But Peter runs to the tomb, and John goes with him, and other gospel records, and they find it empty. They don't find Jesus there. <clears throat> what... What we find recorded here in Luke, and this starts in verse 13. I want to talk about this a little bit. In verse 13, we, Luke records this event where Jesus, he's resurrected, and he appears to two disciples who are walking on a the road. They're walking, and these two disciples are, are very um, discouraged. They were going to a village named Emmaus, it's about seven miles from Jerusalem. They've been at, they've seen the crucifixion. They understand all that happened. They're very discouraged by it, and they're walking away from Jerusalem. They're talking about what had happened. Jesus comes up. Now, they don't recognize him because Jesus can see, he made it so they could not recognize him, but they think he's just some, some person, um, a Jew probably. Jesus walks up to them, and Scripture records that they stood still, looking sad. This is verse 17. Because Jesus asked them, what, what, what is it y'all are, what is it you're talking about here? He knew they were talking about, you know, Jesus and how terrible this was and, 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 and what the Romans did and what the Jewish leaders did. That's what these two men are talking about. And Jesus comes up and says, hey, what, what's that all about? What, what, is, now what, are you, what is it you're talking about? And, and Scripture records, make a note of this, that these two stood still and they were looking sad. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. And they respond to Jesus who says, now what's this about a Jesus? What happened now? What is it you're talking about? And they basically say, have you been under a rock? Here's what they literally, literally said. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Where have you been? Is what they say to him. Well, Jesus kind of plays along, and, and they talk about, you know, hey, well, you know, Jesus was a man, a prophet. He was mighty in deed and word. And, and the chief priests and the rulers, they handed him to be condemned to death, and they crucified him, verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Do you hear the sadness? They are, they are, it's over. Verse 22, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, early in the morning. When they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Here's my point. They had hoped that he was the Messiah, he was killed. Some have found an empty tomb. Some have confirmed an empty tomb. Where's their hope? Where's the hope with these two? They looked sad, and they already knew what you read here. They already knew this. They knew the tomb was empty. They knew Peter and John had confirmed that. They knew the women said angels talk to us. But what are they? Sad. And my point is... The early disciples were very skeptical to believe that he was risen. Okay. That will, make more, that will uh, have more meaning as we go. Jesus, we read on in Luke, Jesus opens their eyes. He'll actually go and eat with them, but he opens their eyes um, so that they recognize him. That We were talking to Jesus the whole time. We didn't know it. And then he disappears. In verse 31... What do these two do? Because now, see, they've seen the risen Jesus. They go, the same hour, they return to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. 
Then they told what had happened on the road, how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And we'll find out that <clears throat> Jesus, see, he went to their house, or he went on to where they were staying. He conti- he, and, and so part of what happens there is he eats with them. And that will be important as we go. Well, as these two are telling the apostles, they're, they're back with the apostles now um, in a house with the door locked. That's what John 20, 19 tells us. The apostles in a house, door locked. Why? They're afraid of the Jews. They're afraid of the Jews. What did they do to Jesus? They crucified him. What are they going to do to Jesus Leader, you know, Jesus' apostles, what are they going to do to them? They might crucify them too. So they have the door locked. Meanwhile, Jesus comes in and he's now with them in the room. He didn't open the door. He didn't break in the door. He just came in. And he says, why are you troubled? Why do your doubts arise in your heart? See my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Remember doubting Thomas who gets such, oh, Thomas gets a bad rap. You know, he said, when they first told Thomas Jesus had risen, Thomas said, I won't believe it unless I touch his hands where the nails were and his side. I won't believe it. And truthfully, all the apostles were, were kind of that way. They were skeptical to believe. They thought they saw a ghost. And Jesus makes a statement here in verse 39, a spirit does not have flesh and bones. And no doubt Jesus is preparing them because a time is going to come in their very near future. A time is going to come when they're going to question, they may question this or someone may question them. They're going to say, we saw Jesus. He rose from the dead. And someone's going to say, how do you know he rose from the dead? Because we saw him. How do you know it wasn't a ghost that you saw? How do you know it wasn't a ghost? And you can tell that Jesus is, he's, he's cleaning all that up now. Because, let's read on, verse 41, while they still disbelieved for joy, in other words, it was just too good to believe, they were marveling. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? Now, when you read this, you might think, wow, Jesus must really be hungry. You know, I mean, he's appeared to him, he's let them touch his, his, his scars, And now he's hungry. I'm starving. Do you have anything? He's not starving. He's not. They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate before them. Why is that important? He's proving that he's risen. He's proving. And they're going to need that later. Now, they'll have the Holy Spirit later. But we're going to see a massive contrast in these apostles who are hidden in a room, door locked. Here in a moment, we're going to see a whole different Peter and John. Do you ever find something about Scripture too good to be true? Do you ever see other people walking with God and you think that's good, I'm happy for them? I mean, obviously they can do it, but I can't do it. It's too much for me. I can't cut it. I see other people's sins being washed away or forgiven, but not mine. I can't, it it won't, I, I can't accept it. We say, you hear the preacher talking about forgiveness, God forgives, and your sins can be wiped away too, and you say, I, you don't know my sins. Not, I don't think so. Sometimes we even make this statement, I, I understand maybe God forgives me, but I can't forgive me. And what that one's really about is, I don't really believe God has forgiven me. Too good to be true. Let's go back to this question I started with. Why do you believe that Jesus really died and rose again? One reason is there's no other explanation for the empty tomb. Where did Jesus' body go? Someone might say, well, maybe the Romans took it. The Romans killed him. Their job is to crucify, kill, carry out a, a death sentence. The guards, the penalty for the guards losing the body could be death. The guards wouldn't lose his body. They would defend his body. The Romans had no motive for taking his body. You say, well, maybe the Jews stole it. The Jews were the ones that wanted him killed. 
They had no motive. They were trying to put this thing out. It was a fire they wanted to put out. They had no motive. Maybe the disciples took his body. The disciples are later tortured brutally, persecuted brutally. They had no motive. They would have folded. They had no motive um, to carry through with that. And so what we find is a real contrast, and this is, this is one of my uh, greatest reasons why I, I'm convinced Jesus rose from the dead. Because think of, think of it this way and understand this. Peter and John, look at this contrast. Peter and John, remember Peter denies Jesus three times. The third time was to a servant girl. That's how scared he was. They are hiding in a room with the door locked. But just weeks later, turn to Acts chapter 4, and weeks later, Peter and John, they heal a man at the temple gate. Now, Jesus has already gone to heaven at this point. But just a few weeks later, Peter and John are at the temple gate. They heal a crippled man, and they are arrested. Remember how Jesus was arrested in the garden? Where did they take him first? In the garden, arrested. They took him to the high priest. Peter and John are arrested, and in, in Acts 4, we read that they gathered together, the Jews gathered an emergency meeting, and they gathered together Jewish rulers, the Jewish elders, the Jewish scribes, the high priest, and all the high priest family. You talk about an emergency meeting. See, they thought they had put this fire out by killing Jesus. The fire's not out. We have a problem. Peter and John are doing stuff now. They call this meeting, they have them arrested, and then they ask them, who gave you the authority to do this? Remember, they killed the last man that did all this. Here's what Peter and John say. Let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. They could not be more bold. By the way, this kind of talk is how you get yourself crucified. That's what they did to the last one, to the leader. Now, these two are leaders, and listen to how they talk to this interrogation. By the way, it's very contrasted to how Jesus, Jesus didn't talk this way to them, because Jesus went like a lamb to the slaughter. He was dying for the sins of man. Peter and John, they're not afraid now. What happened? What changed? Yes, they have the Holy Spirit now, but what else? And the answer is they saw the risen Jesus. They saw the risen Jesus. And the early Christians, by the way, history tells us every apostle except John died a martyr's death. Why were the apostles, and, and some crucified, some beheaded, some other methods, why would the apostles die for this? The answer is they saw it. They witnessed it. They witnessed it. And Christianity did not get put out. Christianity spread all across this globe. And that's why I believe Jesus did come, die for our sins, and did rise from the dead. Notice, I want to show in uh, Luke 24, 46, Jesus makes a statement here. And then we see in Acts 2, 38, by the way, these two books are, are uh, part one and part two. Acts is a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Luke wrote both of these. But in Luke 24, 46, Jesus made the statement, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Here we are 2,000 years later. What's our message? Our message is forgiveness of sins. You and I have a problem the same as everyone else. There, most people today in America are not doing what we're doing. Most are living their own life and they're dead in their sins. They have a problem that they can't solve and they don't know how to solve it. Jesus is how to solve it. Forgiveness of sin. Jesus said it would be preached starting in Jerusalem. And then this is just weeks later, Acts chapter 2. It's 50 days after, after the Sabbath, uh, after Passover. Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's our message. 
And sometimes, here's the irony, just like those two disciples, sometimes you and I can be standing still looking sad. Because something happened in our life, in our world, something in this life that doesn't really matter. It's not eternal. We can get sidetracked and irritated and frustrated and disappointed and depressed. And, and, we're, and we're looking sad. And meanwhile, we are saved in Christ, sins forgiven. We have hope of an eternity with God in heaven. We have a lot to be excited about. We have a lot to be excited about. Those two disciples should have been excited. They should have had more hope, more faith, and that's what you and I need. We're going to close uh, with a song about hope in Jesus. I want you to know the, this message of this book is everyone can come to Christ and submit their life and find forgiveness in baptism through God's grace and Jesus' death on the cross. Everyone. Jesus, Peter said, let every one of you. Did he not? Every one of you. And that's every one of us. If you've never given your life to Christ, do that. If you've never confessed your sins, you've never been buried in baptism, do that. Let us help you with that. If you, if, if you can do that today, come while we stand and sing. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Sealed up.